All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Youth Career Connect celebration. Um, we are so excited to have you guys all here. Um, I feel like we've talked a lot in the last few years, and this is just another time for us to really get together. Um, can you believe that it has been four years? We're all here thinking, like, <laughs> how did that happen? Um, we've hit that four-year mark, and we're super excited, and we, we really wanted to just take this opportunity. We know that many of you guys are continuing with no-cost extensions, but there are a number of you guys uh, that are ending at the end of this month, and so we definitely needed to um, take this opportunity for all of us as a full group to come together, um, celebrate all of the accomplishments that you guys have um, achieved over the last several years, um, recognize the good work that you guys are doing. Thanks. Thank you and uh, thanking everybody for um, their time and effort on all of this. Um, as you'll hear a little bit more later, um, about 30,000 young people have been impacted by the work that, that's been going on with the Youth Career Connect um, grant program. And we are just so thrilled. All of that work really has been to impact the lives of those young people, help them get prepared um, and better um, ready for the world of work and for the world of post-secondary education and get them on um, their pathways. Um, the YCC grant um, had some really lofty goals. We've set some really lofty goals for all of you and have worked so hard. Um, you all have worked so hard to achieve those. Um, and in a few minutes, you're going to hear from Evan. He's going to talk about all the short and long-term outcome measures that were required of the grantees and walk us through how folks have done. Um, and you'll see a lot was asked, asked of you, as you guys know. Um, you were asked to really rethink the way um, you work with students. You know, bringing in career and technical and occupational skills training in the classroom in a creative way, um, building and strengthening partnerships not only with post-secondary um, educational institutions to figure out how to do dual, dual credit programming, but also really build a new or really strengthen existing partnerships with um, businesses in your community. That has been a big um, effort. I know some of this was really new to a lot of the schools and school districts um, that are grantees. Um, and, you know, developing partnerships with the workforce system where, you know, some of you are the workforce system, but many of you are, are new to those partnerships and, um, you know, bringing those partnerships together to really understand and, and prepare young people for those in-demand industries. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other community partners that have um, come to the table to really help you all and your community better prepare young people. So um, we know that you guys have worked hard. Um, and we thought that it would be really important to, to recognize that work today, as we've done over the last few years, um, and congratulate you all on those efforts. Um, and so we can take a look at the agenda today. Um, we are going to, um, as I said, celebrate the success. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda Alstran, our administrator, in just a second to share some remarks with you. Um, and I mentioned Evan's going to provide some uh, a data snapshot through June 30th. So I know he was working hard to get you guys all the um, get from you guys all of the most updated data. So so we're going to talk through that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about evaluation updates. Um, and the process on where we're at with that. Um, and then we get to, which is always the fun part, hear from you all. We're going to hear from uh, three grantees um, that we asked to kind of share some stories. And their young people, students, are, are going to be with them and also share their personal experiences um, in the program. And then finally, we'll share some details on kind of like what's next in terms of technical assistance, what's that going to look like once kind of this period of performance ends um, officially the end of, you know, this month. Um, and then for those who are going to continue with no-cost extensions, Angela is going to share a bit about what that's going to look like and what that communication with us is going to look like. So um, before I turn it over to Amanda, though, let's, uh, the next slide we, you can see um, is a little sneak peek um, of the program infographics. Um, that you all uh, worked hard to give us information on. Um, it's uh, there it is. If you can see that, this we have we just threw one up for an example. This is New York City's Youth Career Connect program. Um, 
these are awesome. I want to thank the team for working so hard to pull that information together. Um, you can see that we, we tried to pull some of your um, data points that are really highlighting the best efforts that you guys put forward, um, try to capture kind of the work and the, you know, unique activities that you guys have been engaged in. Um, so um, we got most of the information we need. It's in kind of the final revision stages. We were hoping to maybe have it ready to kind of launch and share with you all today, but we're um, pretty close and we're about a week, maybe in the next week or so, we'll, we'll share with this, these with you. And we appreciate it because we, these are really great um, pieces of evidence for us to kind of share then the story of the successes of YCC. Um, but also we hope that you know, your effort in, in, in bringing this information to us, sharing that with us, is going to be helpful for you all to share your story, to continue, you know, sustaining the efforts and um, building on the work that you've done. And you can have this in hand to say, here's, here's what we were successful in, and here's what we want to continue to do moving forward. So um, we hope that that's going to be helpful for you guys, um, and we are excited to get those. They'll be posted on the um, Youth Career Connect Community Practice soon, and we'll let you know about those. So. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Amanda to share some remarks. Um, so Amanda, thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Um, when Sarah said four years, <laughs> it made me um, shocked, and I'm guessing it did to a lot of you. It's funny, when I think about 2014, a lot happened. Um, you all started your grants. Uh, ETA had a major change in its authorizing legislation in the summer of 2014 to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And um, four years ago next week, I had twins. And so <laughs> uh, just a little personal note, four years is a big milestone yeah. for me as well. But um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with you all, um, amazed that four years has has gone by, but more importantly, amazed at the great work that, that you've done um, and that I've heard about um, off and on periodically throughout, throughout the time that you all have been hard at work on your grants. So I do want to thank you on behalf of the department and the Employment and Training Administration for the work that you've done. Um, you, you are ambassadors of the message, and, and we believe it strongly, too, that um, focusing on building career pathways in high demand industries and emphasizing the linkage between workforce development and education to improve how training addresses employers' needs um, for when people come out of the education and training systems that our country has, that um, those are important efforts um, to our economic vitality, to the experience of our young people throughout their lives, um, and we're excited about the innovation um, and opportunity that you've created for those young people, but also the partnerships that you've built um, with all of the partners in your grants, particularly with employers. Um, we're, we're thrilled to hear about that. Um, as you know, close to 5 million young people are disconnected from school and work today. Um, the ability to connect career services while they're still in school before they become disconnected, we, we believe is really important. Um, and, and like I used the word ambassador earlier, we hope that while your grants are coming to a close, um, some of them sooner than others of you, um, that you think of yourselves as ambassadors of this work, um, that you keep in touch with each other, but also with your professional communities um, and networks and organizations um, over time, that, that you help champion the work that you've done and things like those, um, the sheet we just saw, the fact sheet or the infographic um, can be really helpful to that. Um, I do want to acknowledge, too, that um, given that these, these grants were awarded with H-1B visa fees, um, and it remains a priority here at the department, uh, whenever we use those fees, they line up to the industries and occupations that employers asking for visas in those fields um, are working in. So it's important that we talk about how uh, the work you've done has impacted the healthcare um, industry, IT, financial services, other STEM um, fields and occupations, that these are, are good jobs. You've, you've helped people think about pathways into high-wage and high-skill careers that can really keep 
keep going for them, um, and that is important. Um, I also want to acknowledge that while you've been working on building the career pathways uh, to post-secondary education, um, that you really have remained youth-focused um, and innovation-focused. And I mean, all of these things, none of it's, none of it's easy by itself. Um, I think it's hard, hard when you do it all together, but even, even produ produces even better results when you think about innovation and customer-centered um, and youth-focused all together. Um, you've, you've had to do things differently. That's not always comfortable, um, but I think we've heard all of you attest to that makes a better product and result in the end, and, and we're thrilled um, that you've had that experience. Um, we've also been really excited that your work is contributing, as Sarah mentioned, um, too, to the overall evidence base for what works in um, providing these types of services to young people and others. Um, as you are probably aware, um, more and more we feel here in D.C. that um, Congress and our funders, uh, we hear it from foundations and funding across the country, too, that there's a demand on our public investments making sure they go toward what works um, and having proof to show that. So we, we are interested, uh, we remain interested in helping to, to build the evidence base about what works out there. Um, that also has sort of the informal sense of the word of what works uh, when it comes to sharing best practices and lessons learned. Um, it sounds like this, this community has really been a community together and you've built some great relationships with each other. Um, we do try to and we'll keep trying to um, take what you all are learning and share it with people um, outside of this particular group of grantees but with the workforce system at large. Um, working with our partners here at other federal agencies um, in the implementation of our overall workforce programs. We're, we're always trying to find ways to share what works and lessons learned with our partners through technical assistance, through webinars like this, um, and resources that are available online. Uh, so we'll continue to do that even after these grants are over. Um, that said, it kind of leads me to, to some closing remarks here. Um, as, as, as you may be aware, you know, we don't have an opportunity um, too frequently at the Employment and Training Administration to work directly with high schools um, and the in-school youth population. Uh, we certainly have a very important focus on out-of-school youth, um, and that is, you know, that's, that is our priority, um, but having an opportunity to work with you um, as high schools and in partnership with the workforce development community and focusing on in-school youth has been a, a great experience for us. Um, and while we don't have an immediate next opportunity with that particular target, um, it doesn't mean that we don't remain interested in doing this kind of work, both to help um, make sure that more young people don't become disconnected, but also to help think about how we meet the needs um, of, our, of our economy and, and help people get jobs when they leave school. So um, when, we, when we partner with organizations um, here in D.C. and across the country and work with grantees, uh, states, nonprofit organizations, high schools, um, community colleges, uh, we always have that interest in um, making sure that we have an eye toward what employers are looking for today and tomorrow and that we're pre preparing the workforce of the future. So, um, so we thank you for all that you've done um, there. I, again, I challenge you to think of yourselves as ambassadors, um, even as this work comes to an official close with a grant closing that, um, that you help uh, communicate and provide the information to your colleagues to help them uh, maybe think differently or try new things um, that you've picked up through your experience. So thank you, congrats, um, and I'll turn it back over to Sarah um, and others for the webinar to continue. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and so now we will just turn it over to Evan Rosenberg. Uh, you all know Evan. He's our data performance guru, and he has, I know, been um, talking to a lot of you by email, getting the most, the latest up-to-date um, data. Um, and so I think we are ready to turn it over to Evan. Thanks, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about 
where we are after four full years of the program in terms of data and accomplishments, and I'm also going to highlight some individual grantees as I talk about some of our accomplishments. Um, thanks again, everybody, for um, trying to update your data for those of you who had a couple performance measures where uh, the data might not have been as updated as um, it needed to be, um, so we appreciate you working with us on that. Um, before I go into where we are, I wanted to just give a quick reminder of um, the ultimate goals of the program and how we measure performance and why we measure performance. Um, you know, if you've been around for a while, you've probably seen these slides before in prior presentations, but I think it's important to always keep in mind um, what the ultimate goal of the program was and um, why we have all these different performance metrics. So three key goals of the program. First is to get young people to graduate high school with a high school diploma. Second, obtain a degree or ind industry recognized credential in an H-1B industry or occupation. You heard Amanda talk a little bit about how these programs are funded with H-1B visa fees and so there's obviously an emphasis on trying to get the young people credentials in H-1B industries or occupations. Um, and earn college credits toward a degree in those selected high growth H-1B industries or occupations. And then lastly, to move into a positive placement following the completion of the program, whether that's on subsidized employment, post-secondary education, long-term occupational skills training, or registered apprenticeship. We had two sets of performance measures, short-term measures that are our interim indicators of program progress, and those are the ones we've really focused on um, for the last few years, as well as the long-term measures, which are more outcome-oriented and a gauge of program success upon completion of the grant. So we're finally able to start looking a little bit at those long-term measures. Um, for many grantees, we still can't quite um, look at all of the long-term measures yet, but um, for some of you all, we're starting to look at those long-term measures, and you'll see those later in the slides. Uh, and for each of our 15 performance measures, we had a performance target. Um, reason for the target is to give grantees and the Department of Labor a, a sense of um, whether we and you all are being successful in various aspects of the program. For most of the measures, we set national targets, but for some of the measures, grantees had specific targets based on their program models. For example, some grantees had a grade 9 through 12 program model. Others had grades 11 through 14 um, that included a post-secondary education component. And so the goals of programs that are high school only versus those that included that post-secondary component may be a little bit different given those different program models. Um, and then those targets varied by program year. And we are now going to transition our quarterly performance reports moving forward into focusing the targets on um, the cumulative program to date target for each of the grantees, which you'll see on your next quarterly reports. Um, so just a reminder of what the short-term measures are and um, what the goals were. I'm not going to read through all of these, but you can just quickly see um, our 10 short-term measures there and what the target was for each one. If uh, you had individual grantee targets, then the slide shows that um, it was a grantee target rather than a national target. And then lastly, the five long-term measures and the targets for those. All right, so let's get into the data. Um, so first thing I want to talk about is enrollment. And nationally, we did really well in enrollment. Um, our enrollment target for the four years of the program was a little bit over 25,000, 25,155. And, um, and when we put out a lot of the press releases and, and initial information on the program, we talked about that 25,000 number for our target for how many we'd serve throughout the course of the grant. And uh, nationally, we blew that away. We're over 29,000 youth enrolled, which we're very excited about, 29,323, um, which far exceeds our national target for the four years of the grant. It's over 116%. Um, and and I would anticipate uh, over the next quarter um, with some of the grantees uh, that are continuing on into a fifth year uh, with a period of performance extension, we might actually hit 30,000 enrolled, which um, being a numbers person, I like those nice round numbers. And so I'm excited to see if we can get over that 30,000 mark. Um, in terms of year four enrollment, 
Uh, Sarah and Angela, can you still hear me? I heard a. a we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll continue on. Um, in terms of year four enrollment, we also met the individual year four target. Uh, we're at about 102% of our enrollment for year four. Um, and then in terms of individual grantees, 19 of the 24 grantees have already exceeded their enrollment goals cumulatively, and 22 of the 24 grantees are either exceeding or very close to exceeding their enrollment goals. Um, now the other piece we look at um, in addition to enrollment is exit. Uh, exit means either successfully completing the program or leaving the program without successful completion. So when you look at the exit rate itself, um, it doesn't tell you a whole lot, but you have to look deeper into how many of those exiters are completers. So at this point in the program, we have almost 38% of participants who have exited, which is what we would expect after four years in the program for those nine through 12 models, we finally saw that first cohort of participants complete and exit the program. Um, but then when we look deeper into it, we see that the majority of those exiters were successful completers. And if you subtract successful completers from that exit rate, we're left with about 15.6% of participants who exited the program without completing. So that's a pretty good exit rate in that we're, we're roughly at 85% um, of participants who are successfully completing the program um, looking at that exit data. So that's not bad through four years in the program and we're pretty happy with that. Um, now in terms of individual grantees, you'll see that um, we've identified some specific grantee stars and we've done this for each of the performance measures. I wanna highlight Kentucky in particular who more than doubled their enrollment goal of 740 and enrolled over 1,500 participants for um, an enrollment rate of 206%. In addition to Kentucky, um, Pike in Indianapolis had 164% enrollment rate, New York City 136%, and Los Angeles 132%. Um, so we're really pleased to see some of our grantees far exceeding enrollment goals. Moving on to attendance, um, we had a national goal of 90% for attendance rate um, for attending school, and we far exceeded that with a 95% program to date attendance rate. And for year four, it was pretty similar to what it's been throughout the program at 95.4%. We also had you collect chronic absence data, which are those participants who are absent more than 10% of the time. Um, which obviously we don't want to see a lot of participants fall into that chronic absence pool. And our national target for that one was to try and keep it below 10%. We didn't quite get there, but we got pretty close with a chronic absence rate of 13.8% program to date. Um, so not quite achieving the national goal there. And for year four, a little bit better than program to date. We're at 13.2% for chronic absence rate. Some of our grantee stars in terms of attendance Lawrence County in South Carolina had an almost 99% attendance rate and a 0.5% chronic absence rate. Prince George's County in Maryland had an almost 99% attendance rate and just over 1% chronic absence rate. And then Jobs for the Future in Massachusetts had an almost 98% attendance rate and a little under 3% chronic absence rate. So great job for those grantees. Now looking at enrollment over time, um, we can see uh, this graph shows that um, how enrollment, participation, attendance trends over the course of the grant. Um, you can see that in the first year of the grant, uh, we didn't quite meet our enrollment goal. So we started off a little bit worried about enrollment, um, but we picked that up really quickly in year two and had 120% enrollment rate that more than made up for uh, the slight below 100% enrollment rate in year one, and we've been able to stay above 100% um, throughout the grant since that time. And as I talked about before, we are well over 100% uh, program to date and exceeding that 100% goal. Uh, participation rate in the program, um, our goal is 100% participation. And each year in the grant, you can see we made a little bit more progress in participation, and I think our participation rate is up to 97%, so almost everybody is participating in the program, which is what we like to see. 
Uh, you can see that program exit data climbing over time. That's what we would expect as the program goes on. You'd expect more exiters. Attendance rate pretty steady throughout the program. Um, that attendance rate climbed for the first three years, dropped just a tiny bit from year three to year four, um, but still above the goal. And then chronic absence rate, for the most part, fairly steady, a little up and down, and um, not quite meeting the goal as I talked about before. So a little more information about who we're serving. We serve a little bit more males than females, 55% male. Um, ethnicity and race, um, for race, white was the most common race served at 56%, a Hispanic Latino at 44%, black African American at 22%, um, and then Asian at 4%, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native at 2%, and more than one race at 2%. Some additional demographics. Um, the rate of participants who were low income was almost half of our participants, 47.7%. So we're very excited to see that we're focusing on that specific target population because in the Employment and Training Administration, serving low income individuals is a priority for all our programs. So we're pleased to see such a high rate for that. Um, limited English proficient almost at 12%. Individual with a disability, 6.5%, and then to a lesser extent, those last three categories. Uh, we did serve a few homeless and runaway youth, pregnant and parenting, and foster youth, but um, not a large number of those individuals. In terms of grade level and enrollment, and this gets to the program models I was talking about earlier, um, where different grants had different program models of what grade they came into the program, almost half of our grantees um, enrolled participants starting in the ninth grade, and then roughly a quarter in the 10th grade, and the remaining quarter in the 11th grade, give or take a few percentage points there. Service information, this breaks down all the different service categories for the grant. Um, as I mentioned before, 97% of all program participants receive services. And then here, I, um, I made the slide so that it goes from highest to lowest service, so you can see what the most common service was to the least common service. 79% um, of participants participated in career and academic counseling, 77% industry-specific courses, a little more than half in a work experience, a little less than half in leadership development and supportive services, a little more than a third in employer-provided services, a little more than a third in mentoring. I'll talk more about mentoring shortly. Um, and then about a fifth in community service learning and internships. And in addition, we also had over 4,000 professional development activities conducted across all the grants, which was great to see since that was another goal of the program was to make sure um, that teachers and all of the staff in the schools received professional development, particularly from employers around curriculum and industry focus areas and so forth. Service comparison over time. Um, you'll see that all these service categories increased over time every single year with one minor exception. The career academic counseling went down slightly um, from year three to year four. But other than that, you can see that all of our services increased um, over time. You can see some pretty big increases from year three to year four in leadership development and work experience and supportive services and mentoring. Um, and internships as well. I'll note, so for two of these services, which I'll talk about more in depth shortly, mentoring, we did have a national target, and you'll notice that we, in year four, finally exceeded that national target for mentoring. Uh, the other service area where we had a national target was internships, and you'll notice that we did not meet that national target, which I will talk about in a little while. Yearly program retention rate, this measures um, from year to year the percentage of participants who were in the program the previous year that were expected to continue and whether or not they continued in the program. Um, nationally program to date, just under 70% um, were retained in the program. That's below our goal of 82.9%, and nine of the 24 grantees are achieving the year four retention goal. Um, we have some program retention grantee stars here. Bradley County at almost 98% retention, which is amazing program to date, and almost 99% retention for year four. Nice job, Bradley County. And then Westside in Omaha, Nebraska, 
was also well over 90% at a 92.8% retention rate uh, program to date and over 95% for year four. Uh, great job for those grantees. All right, so let's talk about mentoring. Mentoring is a rate that we've talked about a lot at our national conferences over the years. You're probably tired of hearing us talk about mentoring. Um, and I am very pleased to report that we are exceeding our national goal for mentoring. Um, so great job on that. Uh, program to date through year four, 34% of participants uh, participated in mentoring, and that exceeds our our program to date national target of 31.8%. So great job on that. And then also, not surprisingly, in year four, we exceeded our national target of 21.3% with a 25.4% mentoring rate. Um, so the rates have increased significantly, both program year to date and program to date compared to previous years, and we're finally meeting that mentoring goal. And in fact, half of the grantees are meeting their year four mentoring goals. Um, the mentor and grantee stars to recognize Anson County with an over 90% mentoring rate program to date and 92% in year four. Um, St. Paul in Minnesota, 86.5% mentoring rate program to date and over 82% in year four. And Colorado City in Texas, 84% program to date mentoring rate and almost 80% in year four. So great job from those grantees. Internship placement rate, um, program to date through year four, the internship placement rate was at 17% um, compared to a national target of almost 47%. So this is the one measure where we continue to not quite, uh, or more than not quite, we continue to not meet our goals for internships. Um, three grantees are achieving the internship placement goal program to date. Um, and then nationally in year four, we're at almost 9.5% of participants in internships compared to a goal of 28.6%, so not meeting our goal for year four either. The internship rate, as you saw in the previous slide, um, has climbed from year to year, but um, still below the goal. And then three grantees in year four are achieving their internship placement goal. The good news on internships is that for those who are completing their internships, um, over 96% of them are deemed work ready and met our work readiness attainment. So for those who are in the internships, it appears that the internships are of high quality and the, and the youth participating in them are gaining work readiness skills, um, but not enough participants are getting into those, those internships. We do have some grantee stars in internships, um, and I would like to particularly recognize Puerto Rico whose uh, internship rate is almost double any other grantee in the country. They had over 62% of participants participate in an internship, and that was 96% of their goal. They had set a high goal for themselves. Um, Rosemont, Minnesota, um, in the Minneapolis area, is at 32.8% program to date, which is 106% of their goal. And then manufacturing renaissance in Chicago is at 30, almost 32% program to date for their internship rate. So nice job with those grantees. Um, Post-secondary credit attainment. So this was another focus of the grants is, um, is we wanted to see YCC participants, particularly those in at least 11th grade, um, participate in some type of, of courses that would lead to post-secondary credit. Um, and we have seen almost 10,000 students uh, attain some type of post-secondary credit. So over 32% of the students have obtained post-secondary credit, and that's a significant increase compared to the end of last year where we were just over 5,000 and 24% of our participants. So we almost doubled that post-secondary credit attainment um, for students from year three to year four, which was great to see. Uh, we have an average number of credits of 10.5, for those students who have earned credit, which is great to see. And over nine, gra and nine grantees have over half of their participants obtaining post-secondary credit. Six of them were over 70%, and three of them were even over 80%. Our post-secondary credit attainment stars, um, Putnam County had almost 93% of their participants attain post-secondary credit with an amazing number of 26.2 average numbers of credits for those students. Ivy Tech um, in Indiana had 87.5% of their participants uh, obtain post-secondary credit with an average number of credits of 11, and then Pima County in Arizona 
had an average number of credits of over 18 for those who received post-secondary credit. Talked earlier about um, one of the goals was to get industry-recognized credentials for our participants, and we had almost 3,700 participants so far gain industry-recognized credential, industry credentials. And this one, like the post-secondary credit, has greatly increased since the end of year three. It almost doubled. It was a little over 2,000 at the end of the year three, and now it's getting closer to 4,000. Um, some grantee stars for credentials are Anson County had 303 credentials, which represented 87% of their participants, um, and then Galveston had 250 credentials obtained. All right, now I'll talk a little bit about the long-term performance indicators. Like I said, we have, we're starting to get some data on long-term performance indicators, enough to start focusing on those after four years of the grant. Um, program completion rate uh, is at 53.4% program to date and 47.5% um, for year four. So what program completion rate measures is of those participants who were expected to complete the program by this point in time, how many actually did. Um, I think comparing that to exit data, that rate is still an undercount, and that's one of those rates that um, I had been in touch with a lot of you all over the past two weeks. Um, to make sure that it accurately reflected your program. Um, another component for program completion is that those grantees who have that post-secondary portion of their model, the 11 through 13 and 11 through 14 grade grantees, um, their program completion rates would be ex expected to be a bit lower since in order for someone to successfully complete the program, they would have to move on to one of their post-secondary partners. And, of course, we can't control where students choose to go to post-secondary or if they do go to post-secondary. So for those post-secondary model grantees, I would expect the number to be lower. Um, but overall, nationally, I think it's a bit lower than we would expect. So that is something I would encourage you to continue to make sure you enter accurate data for program completion so we can have an accurate picture of that. Uh, program completion stars, Putnam County, 86% program to date, and then East San Gabriel Valley in California, 83.8% program to date. High school diploma attainment rate is at 67.6% program to date. What this represents, similarly to program completion, is of those who are expected to have graduated high school at that, this point in the program, how many actually did. And again, like program completion, I think this might be a little bit of an undercount. Um, for this one, I know there are a lot of data corrections in inputting those high school diplomas that were attained, but make sure you continue to do that so we have an accurate picture of how many of your students obtained their high school diploma. And to date, we have 17 grantees that have high school diploma attainment rates above 70%, and half of our grantees are above 80%. Um, high school diploma attainment grantee stars, um, upper explorer land in Iowa, uh, had over 98% of their participants graduate high school. Great job, Upper Explorer Land. Putnam County at 91% and East San Gabriel Valley at 87.8%. All right, so the last slide I want to talk about um, is just some uh, participant uh, tracking system reminders uh, for the remainder of the grant. Um, if your grant is ending on September 30th, 2018, which I think is just a few of you, make sure to submit your final quarterly performance report for the quarter ending September 30th, 2018. Uh, we need a final quarterly performance report um, for all grantees who are ending for that quarter. So please make sure to submit that before you shut things down. Um, another reminder, uh, the PTS has an, a data export feature, which was recently updated by Mathematica, and they sent out a communication on that. So if you want to export any of your data, um, you can do that through our export feature. And we also recently uh, emailed instruction reminders for how to export your data from the PTS, and it can also be found in the PTS handbook. Um, grantees who have period of performance extensions, which are most of you, Please continue to input data into the PTS and submit quarterly performance reports until your grant ends. Um, make sure to enter participation dates for year five to ensure accurate yearly program retention. Um, I talked about the yearly program retention rate, and for those of you who have a period of performance extension, that means um, you need to track uh, retention in the program from year four to year five for participants who would be expected to continue in the program. And so Mathematica and the PTS system added a year five um, participation date screen so you can enter those participation dates and we can track that um, 
the yearly retention in the program. And then another reminder, after September 30th, 2018, there are no new enrollments in the program. So any participants that um, you are going to enroll for this school year that just recently started um, in August or September, make sure you get those enrollments in and they have enrollment dates um, of September 30th at the latest. And then the PTS will remain live and available for your use for another year through October 2019, which will cover all of the period of performance extensions, um, because I believe the latest one is uh, through the end of September of 2019. Um, so at the end, if we have any time, we could answer questions about um, any of the data. Um, and as always, you can always email us at the YCC email address if you have any questions or comments about anything that I talked about. And if you need any help with the PTS, YCC support is there to help you. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Soche from Mathematica to give a quick update on the YCC evaluation and where we are on that. Peter. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So uh, we're in the middle of the evaluation, and, and I want to start by thanking all of you uh, for your help and with all of our various requests and visits and all that. So we couldn't have done this without you. So, uh, as many of you know, there, there's, there's two components to the study. There's an impact study and there's an implementation study. Um, the impact study is, is different than the performance um, stuff that uh, Evan's been talking about because it's comparing the YCC students uh, with similar students who are not in the YCC program. So, um, it's looking at the, at, at the differences in their outcomes. Um, so the impact study is, there's two designs. Uh, uh, one of them is, is this lottery-based or random assignment design, which is being done in four grantees. And in three of those, we're going to be doing um, surveys. We, we've just started those. Um, and the comparison group design is bigger, uh, and that involves using the school records data um, in 18 sites to match the YCC students to um, other similar students uh, in the same schools or, or in similar schools. Um, and we're, we're looking really at, at uh, uh, you know, evaluating what, are the, what is the impact of the program on student short-term outcomes, you know, such as school attendance and credit accumulation, math and English proficiency. Um, and we're also looking at, at subgroups, sort of, do impacts differ for different types of students and uh, by uh, different grantees. Um, so that's the impact study. Uh, the implementation study, we're doing that or have been doing that in all 24 sites. As you know, we, we did two rounds of grantee surveys, uh, three rounds of site visits um, covering different dimensions of the program. And we're looking at things like, you know, what types of students does YCC serve? Um, what kinds of program components are being implemented? Uh, what's different about YCC and, and other programs? And what challenges do grantees face? Um, and, you know, how do grantees plan to sustain their program uh, once the grant period is over, which is pretty soon? So uh, in terms of the schedule, um, we, we just started our follow-up surveys in, in, in three of the lottery sites, um, and most of these students are in 11th grade. Uh, we're doing a school records collection um, in 18 school districts, um, and we're in the midst of that. Uh, we have a, a, a report in spring of 2019 on uh, implementation changes over time and sustainability. At the same time, we also have a short report on employer and workforce partnerships. And then the final big impact report uh, will be due in, in winter of 2019. So again, thank you. Thank you for, for your help in all this. Great. Thanks, Peter. We really appreciate you providing the update for the evaluation. Um, now, at this point, we'll turn it over to what I know we've all been waiting for, which is the grantee student panel. So Maisha, take that away, please. Hi, Evan, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us again, and thank you, Evan, for that wonderful report. We were 
sitting here in the national office waving our hands and doing hoo hoo and hoorays <laughs> at those amazing uh, results. And we want to thank everybody for their wonderful work and thinking innovatively. I think one thing that we were sharing here in the, in the room is that um, you face challenges of location, you face challenges of lack of resource, lack of business opportunities and connects, and you've used those and really have um, thought outside the box to connect our young people to those opportunities in mid middle of America and rural parts of islands um, and also um, in ur suburban areas as well as urban areas. So we've really kind of hit those major uh, parts of our country and so we can learn from those and we really are excited to share those infographics, those um, kind of briefings that we're learning, briefs that we're learning from you guys to, with the rest of the country to share best practices on how to do those. So at this time, we have an exciting uh, grantee student panel, and this is a time for us to really listen to our young people and hear what they have to say about their experiences. And you guys have been with us for four years, so you know how we feel about Youth Voice. We've invited our young people to join us for the last three years um, to participate in a video panel, um, video contest, and, they, and the winners have come to D.C. twice, and to, to uh, Denver once and Evan took them on a nature hike, you know, mm -hmm. so we really enjoy our young people and it's a, it's a joy for us because we don't get an opportunity to hear from our young people, our young people often, and so we're always learning from them and how to best serve them, and so we have this opportunity where we have three um, grantees that are, have some young people with them and we're going to hear from them, so I know we are... I'm going to hear some voices. I'm going to make sure that we can hear everybody first. So first we have Gina with Upper Explorer Land. Gina, are you there? I'm here, Miesha. Okay, Gina, you had two young people with us. Can we hear their voices really quickly as well? Oh, I'm Joe, and I'm Hi. Taylor. Hi, Joe and Taylor. We can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Great. Then we have Catherine um, with us from Putnam County in Georgia. Catherine, are you there with us? Hey, Maisha, we're here. Now, um, actually, well, who, now who do we have with you? I'm just going through. I'm just going through each one. Who do we have with you? Um, I have a senior at Putnam County High School, Hunter Franks, with me. Perfect. Hi. Perfect. Hey, we'll get back to you guys in a second. And last but not least, um, Kathy, we have you with Pike. Yeah. Hi. I'm here, and I have with me Mr. Martin Dix. Uh, Perfect. So we have everybody. We can hear everybody. Making sure we can hear you guys and. Not talking so lightly. Perfect. So we're going to actually roll back and talk to Gina and our colleagues there, uh, Taylor and Joseph, or Joe, as he would like to be called there in Upper Exploraland in Iowa. And um, Taylor, if you could take a couple of seconds and remind us, as we've heard from you guys throughout the four years of, of your program. Gina. Yep. Gina. Did I say who did I say? Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, Gina. Gina. Gina, I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the slide, I'm looking at my paperwork. Gina, I apologize. If you could tell us a little bit more about your program again, just remind us, and then we'll talk to Joseph and we'll talk to um, Taylor. Sorry. I know you're very excited to talk to the students, so we will get to them. <laughs> we'll get to them quickly, I promise. Um, so thanks for inviting us to be part of the webinar. Uh, we appreciate that. And um, our Iowa program involves 22 school districts. Um, which is 24 high schools that we work with, over 5,000 square mile radius. Um, we have three partners, uh, Upper Exploraland Regional Park Planning Partnership. We have um, ECIA, and then we also have Northeast Iowa Community College, who I'm with. Um, our schools are primarily rural, and I think um, our guests here will talk a little bit about their schools, so you kind of have um, an idea of if you can picture where they're located. Um, we're a junior senior program and our pathways are healthcare, advanced manufacturing, STEM, information technology, business and finance. Um, and we're also uh, supported by the Workbase Learning um, Initiative in Iowa, the Iowa Intermediary Network. Um, so we'll be able to um, continue a lot of what we're doing through that and some other efforts that we have going on. Thank you, thank you. So. Uh, you have two young people um, there with you, and we absolutely want to hear from these two seniors who are embarking on an exciting, fun year, your last year of high school. Let me tell you right now, it doesn't get any better, so don't let anybody fool you. Enjoy your childhood as much as possible. <laughs> just joking. Um, <laughs> While you have free rent. I'm just kidding, Joe and um, Taylor. So while we hear from you guys, what did you guys get out of this program? Let us know um, what, you, what you gained from this wonderful program that you're a part of there. 
Okay, I'm Joe, obviously a senior from West Central Charter High School. We come from a really rural Northeast Iowa community. Our student body consists of 80 people. Um, I'll be really close to graduating with my AA degree. Uh, as a junior, I took a, a welding certificate program and a, gel, a general building construction course, which both earned credits towards, an, uh, towards their respective associate's degree. And this program has really opened my eyes and given me a, a realistic look of different industries. Yeah, and I'm Taylor, and I'm also in the same class as Joe, um, and we go to the same school, obviously. And unlike Joe, I will graduate with my AA degree before I graduate high school. Um, I also took the welding class with Joe, not with Joe, but the same welding class as Joe. And like Joe said, this, this career learning link has really opened my eyes and given me a lot of opportunities that not a lot of other people get. Which, is, which I'm extremely grateful for. Exciting, very exciting. We're gonna come back to you guys. I, I remember one of you gentlemen, you had a football game on Friday, because you, you know, I remember that one. I can't remember which one you guys played for football. And secondly, one of you guys wanna be a police officer, so we'll come back and learn about that experience as well in a second, okay? So next, we have our colleagues um, with us from the YES program in Putnam. County, I believe. Yes, Catherine is with us. Um, and Catherine, give us a little breakdown and share with us again um, the successes of your program and what you guys are doing there in Georgia. Thanks, Maisha. Um, yeah, so we're from Putnam County, Georgia, which is a very small rural middle Georgia community. Um, our, we serve only one high school. Um, the data from one of our infographics shows that we have a pretty low enrollment, but that's actually um, just over 50% of our total high school population. Um, the, the student body that we serve is actually 100% free and reduced lunch, so everybody knows that that correlates to the number of low-income students that we have in our community. And so, um, really the grant opportunity provided us with a springboard to be able to um, really build a good educational body that, is, that would be a viable um, pathway and pipeline for employment talent, um, hopefully, well, what the goal was hopefully in our community. Um, with a lot of rural America, we're struggling with economic development and were at that time, and we still do, um, but we felt like if we could truly prepare our students for um, high demand and high growth industries that we would be um, better preparing them to be successful in their life later on after they left us. So um, the grant provided us the ability to be able to um, implement some different tools and resources in our school that we weren't able to do before. And through uh, probably over the past 10 years, our graduation rate has grown from like 60% to over 90%. And um, you saw that in some of the numbers that Evan gave earlier. And so we're really proud of that. Um, we're really proud of the education that we can provide the students of our community. Um, and in particular, in our program areas of healthcare, information technology, and welding, our students have really excelled and succeeded. Um, and you know, they speak. You'll hear from one of our superstars that we have here at our school in just a minute. But um, overall, our students are excelling in the classroom and applying their knowledge. Um, to date, we have had students earn um, 20 technical college diplomas in our different areas that we serve under the grant program and then also seven associate degrees, and those are in a wide variety of different areas, um, anything from welding and technical studies all the way to um, social work. So we're just really proud of the, the, um, of the grant program and how it's grown and, and the successes that we've had to show that it is possible to do something of this magnitude in a rural um, community, small community in the middle of Georgia. Um, so with that being said, it was very hard to pick just one student to um, share with you all, but um, Hunter Franks is a senior at Putnam County High School, and he is pretty much the epitome or embodies what we would all hope for any of our students um, and the successes that he's had through um, the program that we offer here at our high school. So Hunter? All right. Uh, hi, my name is Hunter Franks. Like Ms. Reed said, um, I'm a senior at Putnam County High School. Um, I started doing the S program in 10th grade. Um, I went into the healthcare science pathway, pathway excuse me. Um, I completed the nurse aid course and the acute care nurse aid uh, pathway um, on the dual enrollment level. I earned two technical college certificates and nurse aid certification. Um, 
I have 50 credit hours um, in, in dual enrollment classes. I've done clinical internships at a local nursing home and a local hospital. Um, initially, whenever I started YES program, I knew that I wanted to be something in healthcare. Um, I thought maybe nursing. So I tried it out. I took the nurse aid class. Um, I've kind of gotten an interest of emergency medicine from this course. Um, just talking about, you know, like our teacher would mention things about if you worked in the ER, you would have to deal with trauma and stuff. And so I've kind of gotten interest, interest in emergency medicine. So whenever I graduate high school, um, I'll have an associate's degree um, in general studies, and I will also have completed my prerequisites for an EMT program. Um, I plan on graduating high school and attending CGTC in Macon, Georgia, and starting the EMT program. My ultimate goal is to go through the EMT programs and earn an associate's degree in paramedicine. Oh, I'm, we're snapping. We're doing our snaps and claps in here. Congratulations, Hunter. That is wonderful. We're going to come back. I'm writing all your notes down, so I'm, I'm excited for you and your future. And we're going to come back to you and get some more questions with you in a second. So thank you for spending some time with us. I know you guys have a busy school schedule. All of our young people are in school today. So thank you for spending some time with us um, and sharing with us your success story as well. So um, we're going to move on to Pike um, High School. Kathy, you with us? Okay, great, Indiana. Uh, Kathy, same question to you. Share with us the success of, of your program, any challenges that you may have had, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Pike High School. Um, we are thrilled that we have designated this year as a celebration year for our partners, and I want to just share with you that yesterday we designated, uh, we shared the uh, <laughs> we gave certificates and posters to about a dozen of our 50 partners. We'll be celebrating them all year. Uh, just so you know, we have one high school. It's an urban high school. Each graduating class is about 600 students. We are in grades 9 through 12. We offer four career pathways. Those are the advanced manufacturing logistics, biomedical health sciences, engineering, and IT. And we uh, offer in three of those four, we offer a full full four-year sequence of those courses, so students can take four years of each of the pathways. That includes about 30-plus courses, and um, they're all project-based, provided on a digital platform, and one of the things that's really been successful in our program has been the one-to-one -one technology where each student receives a laptop for use in home and school. Um, we've been able to make a huge impact on about a third of, of Pike High School. Um, I'm here with Martin Dix, and he's a member of the Pike High School class of 2019. He's dabbled in computer science and advanced manufacturing, and he landed firmly in the engineering career pathway, and he can tell you a little bit more about himself. Uh, hi, my name is Martin, and I'm a senior at Pike High School, as you said. Um, what I would like to say about the, um, the program is that I think it's really beneficial to me because uh, I, like I said, want to be in engineering. I've taken Intro to Engineering, Principles of Engineering, um, Advanced Manufacturing and Logistics, and right now I'm in Engineering Development and Design. I would say that the, um, I enjoy having the computers. They really help me out throughout the school years. And uh, um, the teachers, I've enjoyed every single teacher I've had in the program. I feel like they're all um, were easy to, to talk to and come up to if I had troubles. We've also had mentors, which um, we had this year and last year, and um, they helped us with projects that we did, one being um, a rugby post, a rugby post construction that we did for the school, for the rugby team, to have a mobile um, rugby post. Um, I've also been certified in, um, in my 10-hour OSHA, and I have my safety, um, safety work permit from um, Advanced Manufacturing. And we also was I was also able to get college credits um, for for the classes for a couple of the classes I've taken. And last year I did an internship at um, Praxer over the summer. Perfect. Thank you so much, Martin. That's amazing. Thank you all. Um, I'll tell all of our young uh, gentlemen who have shared with us <laughs> their amazing uh, journey, and I have some questions for you guys. And I'm going to go uh, travel back um, to Iowa. And so, 
It's Taylor Jeff, I remember one of you gentlemen want to be a police officer, correct? Yes, that is correct. That's Taylor. Hi, Taylor. And I think you were sharing with us when we were talking earlier that even though you had this experience with advanced manufacturing, it still helped, you, helped lead you to another uh, career path. Can you share what, what happened there, why you might change, and, and maybe how this advanced manufacturing may have helped you um, in your new career choice? Well, I've always wanted to be a police officer, um, but I always always thought that I needed a backup plan just in case, just in case things didn't go the way that I wanted them to. And I saw that they were offering this, and I knew that I liked welding, and I also liked um, manufacturing. So I decided to take it, and now that I've taken it, now I have a uh, backup plan, which makes me feel a lot more comfortable going into the um, adult world as of right now. We need welders. Thank you very much. We definitely need welders. <laughs> Definitely. Now, Joseph, if I can remember correctly, did you have a football game on Friday? Or was that Taylor? Oh, uh, we both played. did. How'd you guys yeah. do? Um, well, we're still here, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, good. Enough, so. so, Joseph, you shared with us that you're almost on your way to your AA degree. Do you, I don't remember when we were speaking, were you com you're going to complete that AA degree, or did you think you were thinking about something else for yourself as well? Well, I didn't really set out to get my AA degree. I've just taken a lot of general credits towards it. And uh, I, I honestly do have enough credits that equals an associate's degree, but they're just in different places that they don't really equal anything. <laughs> so you have a hodgepodge, but at least you have them, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's a wonderful opportunity for you um, just to kind of explore different options for yourself. Thank you for that. Um, Martin, I'm going to come back over to you. Um, you had an internship, um, and you shared that you had an internship. Share with us about that experience because I know um, here at the national office, we have challenges finding internships for young people around the country, different grantees, different um, places around the country have um, challenges finding those opportunities. Unpaid internships seem to be very popular. Um, tell us about your internship. Was it unpaid? Uh, did you have a good time? How long was your internship? And, and do you still stay in contact with the people you had an internship with? Um, well, um, I had an internship at Paxair. For, it was a six-week internship, and I was there with um, two other students from Pike High School. Um, during the internship, I job shadowed with the workers there, and I also was a hit um, in charge of the storage count and making sure everything in storage was properly um, stored. And also, I helped um, the other interns from Pike with, like, um, giving out safety um, tests and stuff to the workers that needed the test. The, um, I also, I do I do keep a little in contact with the um, with my mentor there. Her name was Brooke, and she gave me her numbers to be a, a resource later on if I needed any for college. And it was it, it was a paid internship. <laughs> oh, we like to hear paid internships. Wonderful opportunity. Thank you for sharing with us that you're still in contact and you still you got some um, some support from your colleagues there at your internship. Hunter, I'm coming to you, <laughs> Putnam County. Um, it was very exciting to uh, learn that you had experience with the nursing, nurses' aid program, and that that led to an opportunity where you thought you wanted to be a nurse, but now you wanted to go more into the emergency medical field, and you have a plan, which is like amazing. I just like wrote down all your steps. I think I may want to join you one day and, and become an EMT myself. Um, so, where do you see yourself in ten years? Um, in 10 years, I plan on, you know, working as a paramedic, hopefully on an ambulance. Um, I, I do already have, like, a kind of retirement plan set up, too, where I have my associate's degree in paramedicine. And you can have the diploma level um, degree in paramedicine and still teach it, but many places prefer you to have an associate's degree in paramedicine to teach it. So I plan on teaching it once I get too old or too worn out to continue. <laughs> Once those knees get out, give out on you, I hear you. I, I like that plan. We're sitting up here clapping our hands like a plan. Wonderful to teach. That is great. 
We, we love teachers here. So that's great. Thank you so much for that, Hunter, for sharing with your long-term plan. And make sure you write it on a piece of paper and put it somewhere you can see it. And remind yourself of that plan when things get a little rough to say, I have a plan, I have a plan, I have a plan. Okay, so we're going to get to the adults. We're going to get to the um, folks that run these programs. We want to hear um, from you, um, Gina, uh, Kathy, and Catherine, and I'll go down the line uh, quickly about your employer partnerships. We understand that um, employer partners were key to this grant program, and it can be a challenge. Mo I mean, you all are in uh, very rural areas where that is a major challenge to get employers to the table, to have them stick, to give those internships, those job opportunities. Um, so, Gina, can you share with us um, how local employers contributed to the success of the program, how you how you engage them? Was anything that, any technical assistance that we provided help with that or your coach? Um, can you share with us your experience with employer engagement? Sure, we um, we have very engaged employers from across um, the district, and um, they primarily provide um, work-based learning opportunities for our students. So we try to provide a job shadow to every single one of the students in our program. Um, I know that both Taylor and Joe had those experiences. Um, so in a lot of different areas, we also, um, we partnered with, we, I know there's been a lot of talk um, when we all get together as grantees that healthcare opportunities are hard to come by for students because of uh, liability issues. And we were able to part, partner with Gunderson Healthcare in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which provided um, experiences for our students at their Integrated Center for Education where they could actually go see live surgeries. Um, with two-way communication with the uh, with with the uh, operating room, so that was a unique experience for those students. Um, and they have facilities across our region, so that benefited them as well um, as an opportunity to um, let students know about the the employment that they have and the potential for that. Um, but from advanced manufacturing. Um, all of our pathways, we really had a lot of opportunities for students through our employer partners. A lot of our employer partners are very active in local um, sector boards that we have throughout our region. Um, so that's another way that we're able to engage them and those sector boards actually all have goals that they're working toward and a lot of those are to make better connections with their local school districts um, or better connections with um, just the young people in the area to let them know about the opportunities that we do have available um, in rural Northeast Iowa. Cool. Catherine, um, how about you? How was your employer engagement? Was it easy? Was it challenging? Did you have employers on board already or were you able to expand immensely? Can you share with us your employer engagement strategies? Sure. So we did um, We did have employers that were on board initially, um, and I think a lot of us saw an, a level of, um, from the time that an MOU was signed to the time of actual, like, implementation, that there was some discrepancy there. And um, so we did have some growing pains when we were trying to get the program off the ground. Um, it wasn't, our struggle wasn't necessarily um, engaging employers, it was having employers buy into long-term opportunities for our students, so internships um, and apprenticeships was a big um, hurdle that we had to try to uh, find solutions and creative ways to overcome. So um, Hunter and I actually were just sitting here talking about that um, he was working with our health science teacher and our local EMS director, and he may end up going to do a ride along. So our local community supports a lot of short-term endeavors, um, and but we did face our challenges similarly um, to what Gina was describing as far as like liability. We we um, came across that in not only healthcare but also in um, welding too. That a lot of the employers didn't want to take on that liability and risk of having a minor at their workplace. So in, um, in partnership or collaboration with our T, my TA coach, Libby, um, I threw out one day an idea about having employers bring projects to the school for our students to work on. 
And um, that is something that we have done and we continue to do. And actually, um, in our partnership with our local chamber and our development authority, have been able to bring in more employers, not necessarily in the pathways that are yes focused, but just in general, an employer um, being able to provide us with some materials and some training for our kids to work on projects to see that our kids are capable of putting out quality work. Um, and they're creative in problem solving and can come up with solutions um, to things that employers uh, struggle to do. So um, I, just one quick example is that there's um, a local manufacturer who produces shipping pallets of all things, and um, they're talking about coming on and bringing us, you know, say they get a purchase order for some type of unique type of crating that they have to do and assigning our kids that same project. So I think just being really creative is how we found some success. And then also through our partnerships, through our technical colleges um, and the uh, MOUs that they had with employers to allow um, college students to be able to go and work at those facilities enabled us to be a little bit creative and um, offer a wide variety of opportunity um, over the past four years for our students. Cool. Thank you for that. And thanks for, um, I, I, I like that flip model too. I, I do enjoy you, again, thinking outside the black box and how you can meet your needs. Um, you know, for our young people when there's some challenges and distance and limitations on resources. So thank you for implementing that and, and coming up with a creative way to, to make that work. Uh, Kathy, we're going to go to you. Um, again, same question, same series of questions about employer engagement. Um, how does that work for you? Were you able to, again, sustain longer-term employer engagement, short-term ones, or expand your, your network for our young people? Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, we've, we've been lucky enough in the YCC program at Pike High School to have, have a designated staff member whose pretty much sole job was to just connect with partners, build relationships with those partners, and then grow those relationships with partners. So that's been a really successful model for us. Our partners range from the Chamber of Commerce to Ivy Tech Community College to um, other local universities and then, then our local employers. Um, they've done everything from donated materials and equipment. Some have come to the school and offered employability workshops, um, sponsored robotics teams, served as mentors, as um, Martin was explaining, those, that we have several mentors that come in every two weeks and work with the students on their projects in the engineering class and the biomedical classes. They uh, certainly have, have opened their workplace to um, students. Uh, the first year we had our program, uh, one uh, niche drug company that's in our area invited every biomedical class in for a tour and pizza, of course. So that's been really successful. Uh, at Pike High School, all the ninth graders participate in a job shadow, which is pretty impressive. That's about 900 students who take part in that. And uh, we also have a really interesting connection with um, a group of IT professionals who come in and uh, work with our teachers. It's called Teacher Tech Connect, and we have a Student Tech Connect. Uh, the IT professionals, uh, 15 or 20 at a time, come in and do roundtables, panel discussions, and give teachers a really a better idea of what the demands are in the workplace for IT workers, what the attributes are that students could have that would make them um, good candidates for IT positions, and lots of them told their stories about about how they succeeded in their careers. And that always included a networking opportunity for students to talk to the professionals from IT department. So that's been, a, I think, an area of strength for Pike High School. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Um, I like the pizza party. I would, I would be at the pizza party, but that's, that's a great way for companies to actually get young people interested in that field and share with them, um, you know, at the work site, those types of pieces to, see what classes you may need to be strong in and the possible opportunities in your, in your area, in your region um, for uh, future growth and future career opportunities. So thank you for that. Um, Gina, um, you all are going to be continuing on in your sustainability. Um, the grant is, has, is ending for you guys. And my question to you is, what are your plans for sustaining the program after this period of, of time? for you? I mean, are you planning on continuing to connect with your peers, with your network you've created amongst your colleagues here at YCC, or what are your plans for sustainability? 
Um, that is a great question. We have a lot going on with sustainability, actually. First, with the program itself, we have um, a step-by-step -step plan designed that we um, are going to have students continue to, to enroll in the Career Learning Link. Um, and we're really intentional with our sustainability model of having students do experiences in each um, area of the career continuum. So we want them to start with like an awareness activity where they might go on a tour or to a career fair and then move on to exploration where there would be more of the individualized, like a job shadow. Um, and then workplace prep preparation would be that final stage where students will still have, if it's appropriate and they've made a commitment to, um, to the career that they have the potential to take a career pathway certificate, um, like Joe and Taylor did, um, that could potentially be funded for them. Um, so we have been sharing that with our school districts, how that's going to continue, and they've been very supportive and they're excited that they're still going to have a career coach in each one of their schools. Um, the career coaches are also serving a dual function now. They are actually also our admissions reps for the college. So since they're in the school so often, the students are really um, used to seeing them, comfortable with seeing them. And so counselors are sending um, students to see the coaches, even if they're not in Career Learning Link, to answer their questions about continuing their education at Northeast Iowa Community College. The other great thing um, that we're excited to continue our relationships with um, the other grantees who had Lyle Newman as their TA. We got together um, once in Iowa, once in Omaha, and once up in Apple Valley in St. Paul, and all really learned from each other. And um, actually, I will be making another trip along with some colleagues from our area education agency um, up to Apple Valley so we can see their K-12 STEM efforts and come back and collaborate on how we might be able to implement some of the things um, that they're doing there. So it's been a great partnership. And um, I don't think we would have all, have been as far as we are now without um, the idea generation from the group of grantee colleagues that, um, that Lyle has helped us uh, establish. So thanks for that, Lyle. Well, we love to hear that, too. Our coaches have been phenomenal. We are really appreciative of their talents and skills. And we um, are so excited. We've heard nothing but wonderful things from you all about your, as Libby would say, your little families, right, and, and how you guys have gotten together across the country um, and gotten together over the phone and used WebEx and face-to-face and -face to really share um, with each other and, and still continue those relationships even if the grant has ended. There's nothing preventing you guys from um, still communicating with each other, um, talking with the school districts about other opportunities to learn from one another. And so we're so excited to hear that that's going to continue for you guys. And we do encourage that across the board for all of the grantees. Um, I have four more minutes, and I have one general question um, across the board for everybody who participated on the panel. I want to thank the panelists um, in advance for your time, Andrew. I know young, our young people have to get back to class and their after-school activities shortly. Um, so just in general, um, is there anything else you want to share about the program? Is there any last words about how YCC has changed the community, the school climate, um, anything of that nature? And I'm going to um, let the young people have an opportunity first. So Taylor, Joe, Hunter, or Martin, do you have any last-minute comments? One word? Happy word? Nope. Okay. <laughs> okay, Gina, Catherine, or Kathy, how about you guys? Um, I think from my perspective, this is Catherine, uh, from my perspective, it, you know, really changed the whole dynamic of how our high school looks at career and technical education um, and how our community looks at it. Um, before the grant, there was some partnership with our local technical college, which quickly was absolved based on some poor management of that partnership. And so, um, you know, seeing, I, I came from the classroom at this high school before the grant and to now, you know, post, uh, at quasi or pseudo um, post grant. And I think we've come a long way, especially proving to our community that we have great students and a great population that's ready. Um, to go to work and be successful in their, whatever their career pathway was. Um, Hunter, do you have any last remarks? Um. 
He's good. <laughs> <laughs> Gina, Kathy, thank you for that, Kathy. I appreciate that. That's amazing. Thank you. Gina, Kathy? Maybe just, yeah. Yes. I just like to share that we're our whole goal is to really make sure that as many of our students from our region um, are prepared for that next step and know what they want to do. Um, you know, aren't going off to college and then deciding that this isn't the right college or the right pathway for them. And we want them to know that we're always um, available to come back. And we're actually starting to see that. You know, when students have gone off and the college wasn't a good fit for them or they decided that program wasn't right, they're still contacting their coaches and some of them are coming back um, and enrolling at NICC and we're really happy to see that rather than, than having them incur that debt um, and not end up with a degree or the career that they want that um, they still have those connections that they're able um, to continue on to the successful pathway that they want to pursue. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank, is anybody else? Nobody else? Kathy? Yeah, sure. I'll take a shot at it. Come on. Um, I, was, <laughs> I think we're probably most excited about the, um, the fact that we've, these courses have been institutionalized at Pike High School. They will go on after the life of the grant, so they'll be sustained through general funds. Students will, again, have an opportunity to create or complete that course sequence, and um, we feel like they'll be job ready when that time comes. So thank you to the grant for making that happen. Thank you so much, Kathy. I just want to um, thank everybody who was on this panel. It was an energizing. It was fun. Um, I'm so, so very proud of our young people, our, these young gentlemen who spoke today and really let us know that um, our young people are ready to work, they're ready to learn, they're ready to be flexible, um, and they have had experiences that most college students have not been able to have because of a program and the innovation of administrators and teachers to come up with a way to get them hands-on learning, get them experience, experiential learning, um, get them outside of the classroom into internships, into mentoring. And we just want to thank everybody for your time today. And we're so proud of you guys. And we look forward to learning a lot more from you guys um, in upcoming months and your successes. So I'm going to actually um, say, yay, I'm clapping, everybody's clapping. Yay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Angela Brown. Um, she's going to share with us some technical assistance that is coming up over the next couple of months, and we're going to be moving forward on our next step. All right. Thank you, Maisha, and thank you, students and staff from the grantees. It was uh, wonderful hearing your stories and being able to share with everyone uh, the great success that this program has been. So I can't believe it's already four years that have gone by. It's amazing. Um, so hopefully most of you have heard, um, and if not, you're hearing now, the TA contract did get a no-cost extension as well for six months, which we're very excited about. Um, you know, we were mindful with, with the funds that we had, and we were able to, you know, use our resources wisely. So we um, are able to continue through March. Um, so what does that mean for you all? That means that we will still have uh, the TA coaches on board. However, they will have permitted hours. Um, and if you haven't already heard from them, you will be hearing from them. Um, they're still available, and we're really hoping, um, you know, as Maisha and I think Gina talked about earlier, that they will use those hours to bring you guys together, whether it's a, it, well, it will be a phone call or on <laughs> WebEx, it won't be in person. Um, but, you know, that you're continuing those conversations to really take advantage of the limited hours that they'll have available. But they are still there for you because we want you to be successful. We know you still have questions. We know that there's still a lot of um, great expertise and knowledge that they can share with you. So. That is still available. Uh, the YCC Community of Practice is still up. It's still available. Um, everything that we have already created is still on there. You can go in and download that. Um, we're going to be updating the big list that we created with all of the new items we've done in the last year, so we'll share that. Um, we'll share the national data infographic now that we have all the data that's, that's been updated. Um, so all of those items are still on there. Um, and they'll be on there for a while. So that's not going away anytime soon, and, and um, at least you know, through the ends of the grants. And we'll be creating new pieces of material and resources um, throughout, throughout March as well. So you know, keep your eye on there. Hopefully, you're all getting the updates and e-alerts from there to know when we've created new um, materials and resources. And we also send those out in our newsletters. Um, so we will be continuing to do webinars. 
like this one. Um, and those are open to everybody. Even if your grant um, has ended, the webinars, if we send those out and it's something you're interested in, and we hope you are, please log in um, and get that information, and we'll continue to record those and post those as well. Uh, we're going to continue the peer-to-peer -peer calls um, that we've been having on different topics so that you all can talk to each other, because we think it's a really great way when you all can share your experience and help each other out with um, any challenges you're having and share successes. Um, it's a really great way uh, to get information because you guys are the ones on the ground doing the work. Uh, the YCC mailbox, that's still there. I'm still looking at those emails. Um, and even after March, the national office is still here. Your FPOs are still available. Um, someone is always going to be there to answer your calls as long as you're a grantee. So, so don't worry, you know, someone's going to respond to you, get you the answers you need if you have questions. So lots of TA is still available. Keep an eye out for, you know, things that are coming up, and we hope you'll join us um, and continue to share with each other so that we can gather these best practices and share those for programs um, in the future and other programs that are happening right now. Just because it's not YCC, there's a lot of lessons learned that we can share with each other. So we're really excited for that. I'm going to turn it back to Sarah and Maisha now, who are going to wrap up. Great. Thank you, Angela, and thank you, Maisha, and all the panelists. Um, I think we've been sufficiently thanking folks throughout this <laughs> last hour and a half. Um, we just, we really are so um, proud of the work that everybody's been doing, and the whole team here at the national office um, and our contracting um, partners, um, Angela and the team of coaches, we just really appreciate all of the work that they have been doing and will continue to do um, in the next several months. Um, as Angela said, we are still here at the national office. We will continue to be here. Um, you can always send uh, questions to the YCC email box. If you have any burning questions right now in the last 30 seconds, maybe, <laughs> um, throw it in the chat um, as I'm wrapping up if you have anything. I know Evan had said if there was time at the end, if anybody had any questions, um, feel free to throw it in the chat right now. But um, I haven't seen much in terms of questions on the chat, but I have seen a lot of kudos to um, all of the different uh, teams for some of the good, uh, you know, performance um, outcomes and uh, measures that Evan talked about to some of the um, great, exciting activities and um, that the students are engaged in that they shared with us today. So um, I think with that, I don't see any questions. Um, I know a few of you are still working to, to um, get your data updated in, P in um, the PTS, and you are working with Evan on that, so thank you again for that. Um, as a reminder, we are going to have those infographics in the next week or two out, and we will share that with you and get those posted. Um, I'm looking to Angela now. Are we, what else? Do, what else do we need to say? We're, we're still here. We're not saying goodbye to everybody. I know there's some <laughs> folks that are actually finishing, but I kind of feel like we might still connect with some of you. <laughs> of course. Um, because, you know, this, these really important grant programs, as I have experienced over the years, you know, you guys are a cohort, you've gone through these challenges together, you've learned a ton and you've grown a ton and you guys all got to kind of benefit from each other's challenges and, and, and solutions. Um, and so we really do hope that you continue those relationships moving forward. Um, as Gina was mentioning, you know, for those folks in the in the Midwest, we'll continue to share and learn from each other. Um, Maisha shared. We we do encourage you to continue to do that. So um, the conversation is not ending in any way, um, and we're always here. If you're finishing um, the end of this month, um, you have our email addresses, and we're here to reach out. And we are constantly working to ensure that young people are prepared, whether they're in school or out of school.